This is the last of the videos that cover the design and operation of the turrets and guns on Battleship Texas. If you watched my other videos, you know that we worked in reverse order to show how turrets were trained and guns pointed. We then showed the movement of shells and powder bags from their magazines, through upper handling levels, and ultimately to the turrets and guns. From there we showed loading procedures, then how gun barrels, projectiles, and powder were made. We'll now put a bow on it by looking at the primers and firing locks required to ignite the powder charge and send shells on their journey toward destruction. Before we talk about the primers used to fire Texas's 14-inch guns, let's take a look at a rifle cartridge in its primer. In its base is a percussion primer used to fire the gunpowder charge. It consists of a cup that contains a small pellet of primer mixture that is extremely sensitive to shock and friction. In front of the mixture is an anvil. The primer cup is dimpled when struck by a firing pin, which crushes the mixture against the anvil. The shock and friction created by being crushed ignites the mixture, which in turn sets off the charge. How does this possibly relate to firing a 14-inch gun? The Mark 15 primer seen here was not only used to fire the 5-inch and 14-inch guns on Texas, it was used on all Navy bag guns, including the 16-inch guns of the Iowa class. It was a combination primer that could be fired either electrically or by percussion with a firing lock and hammer. Here's an internal view of the assembly. The reason for talking about a rifle primer is because one is located inside the Mark 15 and is used to get things going. Behind the primer is a plunger held firmly in place so that it cannot easily move. However, when a firing pin strikes the plunger, it's forced forward where it dimples the rifle primer. That causes it to flash through a small hole and ignite the combination of black powder and gun cotton that in turn sets off the primer charge. Even though the primer could be percussion fired, that was not the preferred way. Electric fire allowed more precise timing and could be fired locally by the gun pointer, remotely in main battery plotting room, or from either of the two fire control towers above the main deck. The electric circuit bypasses the rifle primer and consists of a conductive path created by the brass case through a small ignition wire called a bridge wire that was wrapped with gun cotton fibers, then through the metal plunger. The plunger is electrically insulated from the case so that the circuit is only completed through the bridge wire. When a firing key is pushed, the bridge wire flashes white hot and ignites both the wad of gun cotton and the black powder ignition charge surrounding it, which in turn sets off the main primer charge. Firing a primer required a lock mechanism. Unfortunately, we don't have one since all were removed from the ship when she was decommissioned, so we'll have to work with photos and drawings of the Mark 14 combination firing lock that was used to either electrically or mechanically fire the primer to ignite a powder charge. Like the primer, this lock design was not only used on Texas's 5 and 14 inch guns, it was also used for all Navy bag guns for more than 70 years, including the Iowa class's big 16 inch guns. It was in this lock that a primer was installed after the breech plug was closed and just before it was made ready to fire. This drawing shows that it was a pretty complex design and it had to be. As a combination lock, it was able to fire a primer either electrically or by pulling a lanyard for percussion fire. It also had to be completely safe until the final moment that the gun was ready to fire and the gun crew in a safe position. Now what I want to do is to point out how the uh, firing lock mounted and uh, the way it basically operated in conjunction with the breech plug. But before we do that, let's take a quick little tour of the plug itself because there's some features of it that are important to how that uh, firing lock worked. First of all, the breech plug is the part of the breech assembly that when it opens, you can see here's the locking threads that when the breech plug rotates, locks it into what's called the screw box. Now on the forward part of that, you see this rounded portion. This is called an obturator. And when the gun fired, this actually pushed back and it squeezed this uh, lining material here to seal the bore so that the ignition gases didn't shoot out through the threads. What you can't see is there's a little hole right here that travels all the way through to the back of the breech plug. That's called the primer vent hole, and that is what you know, here we go. That is what the primer fired through. Now we'll get a little closer look, but uh, this is the back part of, or the spindle on that obturator. It actually comes all the way through, and this is the little hole where the primer itself actually fit into. When it fired, it shot its flame up through that vent. There's also some locking lugs on here so that when the, uh, the firing lock was mounted, it would be 
placed on and then rotated to lock it onto these threads. There's a bracket here. This acts as a guide because that uh, you'll see some drawings and I'll describe it in more detail. But to operate that lock, there was what was called an operating bar that fit in there and attached to what was called the wedge on the lock. And then in turn, there's a set of cam in this, uh, this is called the lever cam. And there is a pin on the end of that operating bar that uh, works so that when the breech was closed all the way and then swung up, the plug, not only did the, uh, did the plug rotate to lock into place, but then that cam forced that, that uh, operating bar to the side, and that's what closed the firing lock and made it ready to fire. Now, an important thing to notice about this is in the process of swinging this lever up to lock everything in place, the uh, breech plug fully rotated and locked into position before the lever even reached its final point. This is important because that last bit of travel is what actually closed that firing lock up and made it ready to fire. By the way, you can see I'm sweating profusely. It's well over 100 degrees in here, but that's okay. I've got ice packs and Gatorade down outside the turret. Anyway, as they, so the operator, the plug operator, or the plug man, when he closed it and rotated it up, that uh, the breech was locked. The firing lock was still open enough where he could insert a primer, and then he closed it all the way. There's a little hook right here on the end of the lever that locked under a latch here. This is called the salvo latch. And with that, the uh, breech was fully locked and ready to fire, and it couldn't be opened. By the way, the worst that could happen is if for some reason there was a malfunction, and as that lever was brought all the way up, there's a, a very remote possibility it might accidentally fire. But that's why the breech operator, when he closed it, he stood back here so that as he latched it, if it did fire, it would just jerk that lever out of his hands and then the barrel would recoil. Obviously, the rest of the crew was well out of the way by the time he made that final motion. Looking from above, we can see how the lock's light blue receiver mounted over the lugs on the yellow obturator's stem. We can also see that the primer actually seated inside the stem and was held in place by the lock's receiver and orange wedge assembly. When fired, ignition gases produced by the primer passed through a hole in the obturator called the primer vent and struck the back of the first powder bag to ignite it. We can also see the pink operating bar that connected the orange lock wedge to the lever cam on the operating lever. Here's a close-up that shows how the wedge was pulled back when the breech plug was unlocked and opened. The red firing pin was well out from over the yellow stem where the primer was located. As an additional safety measure, the green extractor arm is open and will not allow a primer to be inserted while the breech is open. The breech has now been swung shut and the operating lever swung up to rotate the plug to the locked position, but the lever hasn't been fully closed. This operation forces the wedge to close enough to push the extractor down so that a primer can be inserted. However, note that the firing pin is still not over the primer, so it's still impossible to fire the primer either electrically or mechanically. The primer has now been inserted and the operating bar has been pushed to almost a fully closed position. The firing pin is still in a safe position and the primer is securely retained by the lock. This is the last safe position and serves to keep the gun safe while the gun crew moves to safe positions prior to firing. One final push of the breech plug operating bar locks it under the gun salvo latch and the gun is ready to fire. The gun crew is well out of the way and even the plug man who has been in control of this operation is safely positioned if a firing circuit malfunction fires the gun during this last move. As we said, it's a combination firing lock that will fire the primer either electrically or by percussion using a lanyard. However, remote electric fire was used almost without exception. Here's a diagram that shows all possible firing locations with red indicating electric fire and blue percussion fire. By far, the most desirable location from which to fire the guns was the main battery plotting room deep inside the ship. The reason was because this is where range keepers that generated and sent firing solutions to the turrets were located, and more importantly, this is where the stable element was located. To fire the guns, a firing key or trigger on the element was closed, and the device waited until it detected the ship was perfectly level on both planes before firing them.
The switchboards used to connect guns to a single circuit for salvo fire was also located here. If there was a malfunction of the stable vertical or other critical piece of equipment in main battery plot, control could switch to main battery fire control at the top of the foremast. Firing solutions could still be sent to the guns from below or partial information from the director in this location if the lower position was completely cut off. The aft fire control tower immediately behind the smokestack provided a second fully functional position identical to that on the foremast. This served not only as a backup, but could also be used to split fire between the turrets to address multiple targets. Yet another remote location was in a fire control booth in the aft portion of the armored conning tower where there was both a spotting periscope and a gun director. If all else failed, guns could be locally fired from the pointer's positions inside the turrets and below each gun. A close look at the pointer's position on the left shows the crank handles he used to elevate his gun. The brown handle on the right crank is one of two firing keys he used to fire the gun if called upon to do so. He could either take aiming information from main battery plot, or failing that, he could use a telescopic sight to aim directly at a target. The blue X's show the only positions from which guns could be percussion fired using lanyards. The gun captain would be in this position and would attach a lanyard to the lock's hammer cocking lever. With one long hard pull, he could then fire the gun. This would be a particularly bad way to fire at a target, since he had no way of directly knowing the precise moment in which to fire the gun. He could only rely upon hearing the gun pointer yell at him and then respond. The split second delay between hearing the command and pulling the lanyard would be enough to allow the gun to drift off target. This meant that the only real value in percussion firing was to serve as a safe way to clear a misfire or simply clear the gun of an unexpended round. Let's take a look at what happens inside the lock during firing. Here are all of the major components involved. However, the firing lanyard would never be attached unless it was going to be used for percussion fire. To electrically fire, the positive lead of the firing circuit was attached to a terminal on the contact piece attached to the hammer. The black insulators isolated it from the hammer to keep the circuit from shorting to ground. A negative terminal was attached elsewhere and the negative path conducted through the gun and gun mount. When the firing key was squeezed to close the firing circuit, a voltage was sent through the bridge wire inside the primer to fire it and in turn fire the gun charge. Percussion firing was more complicated. The key safety feature to it was the lock was both cocked and then fired using one long and continuous pull. This required a large deliberate action to fire the gun and eliminated an accidental discharge made possible by separately cocking the lock then pulling a trigger. As the lanyard pulls the cocking lever back, it pulls the hammer back and the hammer thrust pin or hammer spring puts more pressure on the hammer. When it reaches its furthest travel, the hammer is released and the spring snaps the hammer down against the firing pin to drive it against the primer and fire it. So there you have it. We thoroughly covered the 14 inch guns and turrets on Battleship Texas and we'll soon put a bow on things when we discuss the history of the gun barrels and why they still aren't worn out after firing hundreds of rounds beyond their rated lives.